Hello, Hosanna. Happy Mother's Day. You'll notice that I'm flying solo on this message today. Joanne deserves a Mother's Day off as well, although she was helpful to me in putting together the content of this message, which is, by the way, not just for mothers, not just for parents, uh, it's for all of us. And you'll see that as we go along a little bit. Well, much of what we've learned about parenting through the last generation or two has been from TV shows. And my generation included uh, some of the best TV parents. For instance, the Brady Bunch, which um, uh, seems to have been resurrected these days with the Zoom screen. Uh, the Waltons, The Little House in the Prairie, Home Improvement, um, Bill Cosby, uh, which just shows that one can play a role with not necessarily live it. But the show's a classic TV, and I always found this interesting. It showed more than that. There was more than we think of in terms of, as we look back, of single parenting, for instance. There was uh, different strokes. There was My Three Sons, uh, Courtship of Eddie's Father, a Family Affair. Most of them were single dads, which is something you don't see a whole lot on TV. And of course, there was, over through the years, an awful lot of dysfunctional parenting. Think of Archie Bunker. Think of The Roseanne Show. My dad's favorite uh, favorite TV show I think of all time was Sanford and Son, and maybe that should have been a warning to me as I was growing up. Fred Sanford was a widower who loved his grown son who lived with him and worked with him, but called him dummy all the time, and my dad just thought that was hilarious. Well, the good news is that the Bible has that same mixture of awesome parents and single parents and really screwed up parents perhaps even with a leaning toward the last category. There's an awful lot of messy family dynamics in the Bible. So when the Old Testament and the New Testament both encourage us to honor your father and mother, it doesn't assume that we all live in a tidy two-parent, everything is wonderful, perfect parenting kind of world, as some people sometimes interpret it. The people of the Bible knew that they didn't live in that, and neither do we. So to honor our parents is complex and as challenging as it is to, to honor anyone or everyone, which is our theme for the year, which is to suggest that we do. And that's why we're returning to it today and breaking into our series a little bit to remember what it is like to honor everyone and particularly this group of people. So we're going to talk a little bit about honor today and particularly the honoring that involves parental figures and, and children, very broadly defined. Now to do that, let's first of all remember what we mean by honoring. The Greek word used for this in the New Testament means to see the worth in every person. So worth is not dependent upon what they've done, but it's on the image of God in them, no matter how shiny or tarnished that may be. It means to be of value. And that's cool all by itself. But the word translated into English as honor in the Old Testament, particularly in the Ten Commandments, is where we find this this, this commandment originally, honor your mother, father and your mother, it's, it's Hebrew, it's not Greek. It's a much older word and a bit more complicated. And it literally means to make weighty. It's used in a whole variety of different ways in the Old Testament, but in this context, it means, and the best translation is to honor. So what do we take from that? To carry honor is to carry some gravity, gravitas maybe, some recognition that you have Earn some respect, that experience has given you some wisdom, and that wisdom has been hard won. This is not a light or fluffy word. A person of honor is heavy, kind of in the way of that old slang phrase. <laughs> and um, I'm just wondering, can you think of, as I'm describing that, can you think of someone like that in your life? Someone that you listen to? Someone that you respect? Someone who gets it? If so, hold that image in mind as we explore further what it means to honor uh, today, particularly because I have several encouragement for you. And the first one is to actually honor yourself, to be honored. Now think about that. Why would we start there? Because God doesn't ask us to do what God does not do. God, if God wishes us for us to honor everyone, then God must honor everyone, Right? And more specifically, if God wishes us to honor our parents, then God must also honor parents, right? Yes, indeed. And so we can be honored ourselves as parents, and we're going to define parents a little bit uh, broadly here in a little bit, but just hang on to that for a few moments. And I'm saying this, and I'm putting this up front, especially right now. When young parents in particular, but probably all of us to some degree, are really feeling the weightiness 
there's that word again, of their role more powerfully than usual. This quarantine in particular has been really hard on parents. And there's all sorts of jokes going around on the internet and I collected a few of them here for you to enjoy, but I don't wanna to make too much light of it. For one thing, parents are stuck at home with kids more than most have ever been. And most other activities in life have been canceled, not just in addition to school, except perhaps for mom and dad's work. And they're trying to do that on top of taking care of kids all the time and on top of being homeschool experts all of a sudden. And parents don't want their kids to get sick, but they also don't want them to miss out on some of the fun of life, like birthday parties and family gatherings and, oh my goodness, graduation and time with friends. And the kids are struggling with that. And as the kids struggle with that, that puts additional pressure on parents. And the parents were already stressed like the rest of us because the world has changed an awful lot on us all at once. And let's not talk about how many parents are also trying to care for their own parents. And so many of you who are listening to this, you are too many of whom are in vulnerable ages. Yikes. So maybe it's good to know. Maybe it's good to remember and cherish the realization that God honors parents. And if maybe especially now. And here, this goes on a little bit more because if you're sitting there going, yeah, okay, well, he honors the good ones, but I'm, I'm not feeling really good right now. God honors us even when we don't do it right all the time. <laughs> Most parents, I seriously, I, we found this to be true and, and the data backs it up. Most parents, even in later life, experience a degree of guilt about our mistakes and our failures or imperfections as parents. I see a lot of young parents struggling with guilt these days. And I've been a pastor a long time. I've had many conversations with older parents over the years, particularly parents whose kids have grown up a bit or maybe are struggling a bit, wondering, what did I do wrong? Or having decided that they did do wrong. And then carrying the weight of that, the burden of that, that guilt and regret throughout life. So what if God wanted to lift that weight from us? What if God wanted to substitute another kind of weightiness, the weightiness of honor? You know, God's in the habit of doing that, of lifting weights from us and giving us something better. Jesus said it himself, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Then he talks about the weights of that. Take my yoke upon you, my yoke, which is not a heavy and burdensome thing. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Now, of course, you know this already. That doesn't mean we can just flip off our responsibilities, parents. Most of us never would. We take those very seriously. But we're not perfect. In fact, most of us become parents before we've even fully grown up ourselves. Uh, it, it, it's just one of those weird things throughout history. Most cultures have assumed that as soon as your bodies are old enough to reproduce, you should go at it. <laughs> it's only been recently that young people have been encouraged to slow down a bit, wait a bit longer, grow up a little bit more. And that's a good trend. Even then, however, we don't get it all right. We won't. We'll mess up. And we'll worry our kids will suffer because of our messing up, and, and maybe so. But God honors us anyway. It's astonishing, isn't it? God understands. God's with us in this. And I think God honors every good intent, every night awake, every tear cried, every regret we carry, and every resolve to try again and do it better next time. And each of those things creates in us a weightiness that God sees and God honors and God acknowledges. So here's a question for you to reflect on this morning. How might God be honoring you? How might God be honoring your parenting today, even if you're not? I'm going to ask a series of those questions as we go along, and you may want to stop the video and just, just hold that one for a little bit, have a little conversation with God, and think about it and pray it over. Or we can move on. Because the second encouragement is in, in our desire to honor our fathers and mothers, let's honor all kinds of parents. Now, we encourage you to watch a video before watching this, and um, if you did it or not, but uh, that's okay. But uh, th that was getting at that point, that there are all sorts of different kinds of parents, and, uh, and we could even go beyond what the video did. So let's, let's suggest some kinds of parenting. There's, of course, 
biological parenting, conceiving and giving birth to children. Often this turns into raising and nurturing those children, but not always, and, and not always alongside the other parent. We know that's the reality of the world. And, and so uh, thank goodness there's also step parenting and foster parenting and adoptive parenting. And oh my goodness, I love the folks who do this. People who choose to parent other people's children just because they choose to, just out of love. It's one of the greatest sacrifices one can make, one of the greatest responsibilities that you can take on. And from what I hear, one of the greatest joys that one can have. Sometimes, <laughs> raising children always, whoever's children always has a bit of that mixture in it. And then there's grandparenting, great-grandparenting, which by the way still has parenting in the name uh, and often includes an awful lot of it. It's amazing how many, how much grandparent uh, do in, in terms of parenting. And, and even grandparenting can become a lot more interesting parenting at this stage. What that means is that young parents will often turn to their own parents at this stage in ways that they haven't before to help them deal with the challenges of raising kids. Hey, mom and dad, was I this hard? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what, do you, what would you suggest to me? I knew one man who, uh, who raised a family and his wife died and he married a, a much younger woman um, in middle, midlife and uh, they started a family of their own and he raised uh, more kids, a generation younger than the first one. And then one of those grew up and had some children and she left them in the care of her of her parents. So um, what time I met him, he was 80 years old and raising teenagers for the third time. <laughs> uh, most of us will never do it that way, but we know that parenting in one sense is a lifelong adventure, um, whether it's biological or otherwise, and we'll, we'll get to that because there's also a kind of parenting that we might call mentoring and teaching, coaching, eldering, whatever you want to call it here. And I, I would hope that most of us somewhere along the way have been blessed to have someone like this in our life. Someone who cared for us who didn't have to. Someone who invested in our formation simply because they chose to. Someone who sh showed us or taught us how to do life better than we could have on, on our own. And, and by the way, there are certain stages in life where, where, where all of us children will receive that from someone else better than we'll receive it from our own parents. And um, that's one of the reasons, by the way, it's really important for us to have a healthy children's ministry and have a healthy youth ministry and to have the kind of ministries that are not just um, flash and dazzle and have a lot of programs, and a lot of people in the room, but really are building relationships and building character into the lives of these young people. And often a, um, a, a Sunday school teacher or a, um, or a youth pastor uh, can have a whole lot more influence um, than, than parents can. Um, I know my, uh, my children, uh, my daughters who are well grown, my oldest daughter is going to be 30 here before too long, uh, still regard Jared and Carla as uh, two of the most um, powerful influences in their life and still keep in touch with them, even though they moved out of the area and are no longer part of Hosanna. And I'm just so grateful for that. And that, that takes us, kind of leads us into a, a different kind of parenting that probably Many of us, many of you who are listening to this, have experienced or, um, or offered to the world, which is the spiritual parenting, spiritual mothering and fathering. Uh, we find this even in the Bible. The Apostle Paul said it for it explicitly. He told the Corinthians, I have become your father through the gospel. And he writes to them as sort of a spiritual father. And I, I've had a number of those people, spiritual mothers and fathers through the years, particularly when I was younger. I guess I've had the chance to be a spiritual parent to a number of others and, and still am. We receive it and we pay it forward to those who come after. And um, as I said, these are often not our biological parents, although I'm sure that uh, they want, some of them at least want to uh, breathe into us spiritually, but we're more open to this kind of input from others. So why are all these, why are there all these different kinds of parenting? I think because one of the gifts that God would give biological parents is to remove from us the sense that we carry the heavy weight of responsibility, that it's all up to us. Um, it's not. And uh, this is true for everybody, but this is particularly true among Christians. Remember back in the 1990s, there were a bunch of politicians who were fond of, they found an old African proverb and they were getting fond of quoting it, uh, the, the proverb that it, it takes a whole village to raise a child. And whatever the political dimensions of that, the truth behind it is, 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 is valid. Parents can't do this all on their own. They were never intended to. I think that's why many parents who are struggling to do all of that on their own in a time of quarantine are, are struggling. They're, they're feeling that pressure. 
But those who are in Christ, uh, I like how somebody has said it, the, the flip side of this, it takes a church to raise a parent. <laughs> and, and there's some truth in that too. We are not alone. You are not alone. We are in this together as all the hashtags and all the signs are saying right now. And this is not just the pandemic. That's a temporary thing. We'll get through this and we'll, we'll move on. But it's all of life. We are not in this alone. So I have another reflection question for you that you can uh, uh, ponder a little bit and pray about a little bit. Um, who has or who did God put in your life as a parental figure to you? Uh, besides your biological parents, and maybe not even those for some of us, but um, who has been in your life? Who might still be there? And then the flip side of that, of course, is how might God be inviting you to parent someone today? And then maybe somebody that is not your biological child or grandchild, but it might be somebody that God has put in your path and has given you the opportunity to speak into their life. Think about that for a moment. Well, the third encouragement then is to honor all seasons of parenting. Been alluding to this a little bit, but we know parenting is different when your children are infants than it is when they're elementary age, and it's different than when they are youth, and it's different when they're young adults, and when they're mature, than when they're parents themselves, and then when they're grandparents themselves. Our role as parents changes as our children change, or at least it should. If we're still trying to manage our children's lives when, when they're 50, we probably missed a signal when they're somewhere that it was time to change. And let's also admit that it's hard to do. It's hard to make those adjustments as we go along, particularly if it's our first time through. How do we trust, suddenly trust responsibility to a 17-year-old? <laughs> oh yeah, you, here's the keys, you can drive the car. Here, you can care for your siblings. Here, we trust you to manage your money. When, particularly if it feels like just a few weeks ago, that 17-year-old was an immature 11-year-old. It might be again next week. You know what it's like when we're in that age range there. It's hard. It's hard for us as parents to be able to make that adaptation. And maybe, um, maybe it feels that way to God a little bit. Maybe not hard, but he understands what that's like because we are often that 17-year-old who was just recently the 11-year-old and who may be again. Uh, God what stage of growth does God seem to want to interact with us in? God, God as parents seems to want to regard us as a parent regards their grown children rather than keeping us in infancy or childhood all the time. And, and how do you regard a grown child? You don't interfere. You don't try to uh, all the time. You don't necessarily try to save them from their mistakes, but, but you help them learn from them and you help guide them in their responsibilities. Parents, you give an awful lot of wisdom. And I think one of the mistakes of bad religion is to, is to treat God's people as children and keep them in perpetual immaturity, um, which is why we did this whole thing last year on how we grow up in Christ, how we, uh, a spirituality for a whole life. God doesn't seem to want to do that. And Jesus said so. Now, he used somewhat different relational language here, but he said, I no longer call you servants because the servant doesn't know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends. So you hear, hear that language of the friends is more of a, I call you grown-ups on an equal peer basis with me. For everything that I've learned from my father, I've made known to you. It's not ruling over anymore. It's coming alongside. There's a mutuality in this kind of relationship, a respect. And it's one of the ways that God honors us still by treating us as his friends and inviting us to do the same. Now, admittedly, we're sometimes not ready for that. We don't get there right away. Paul complained to the Corinthians. He thought they should have been there. He says, I fed you with milk and not with meat, for you're not ready for it. And his implication is you've been in this long enough. You should have grown up a little bit more by now. It would be like what we would say to a 17-year-old if they're still acting like they're 11. I'd like to give you more freedom. I'd like to treat you more like a grown-up, but you can't handle it yet. You're still acting like a child, so i got to treat you like a child. Now, there is a flip side to this. There's always a flip side. Sometimes parents don't want their kids to grow up. They're afraid of them maturing. And uh, fortunately, God isn't. He wants us to be mature. He wants us to be weighty. Like I said, that's why we spent all last year talking about the seasons of faith. And so God invites us into whole life parenting. We're recognizing, we recognize that our parenting of others changes as we grow and changes as they grow. And that God's parenting does as well. Think about that. God's parenting of us changes as we grow more mature. 
and uh, he adjusts to uh, what is new and what is real within us. So here are some more reflection questions. How might God be encouraging you to notice the change of seasons in your parenting of others? Is there some shift that is time for you to make with those that you are parenting? And how that maybe is God's parenting of you changing? And what kind of distress or what kind of noticing are you doing about it? Hmm, God isn't acting quite the same way for me anymore. Maybe it's actually a sign of honor that God is saying, guess what? You've grown up. I'm trusting you with more. I'm not, uh, I'm not treating you like a three-year-old or even 11-year-old anymore. I'm recognizing your maturity, and therefore, we have a little different relationship that we had before. That would actually be a beautiful thing, wouldn't it? Well, let's honor all seasons of parenting. Let's also honor all kinds of parenting. Now, I'm not referring here to the kinds of parents that I mentioned earlier, but to the various ways that parents parent. There's many different ways to parent as there are people and no one size fits all approach uh, fits everybody. One size fits all is hardly ever true. <laughs> I apologize for the, uh, for the graphic here, but it made me chuckle and I'm hoping that it makes you chuckle to chuckle too. Uh, how to parent can't be one size. It depends an awful lot on the personality of the parent, the personality of the child, the personality of the other parent. If there is one or more, often there are very different parenting styles in the same fam family. And sometimes mothers and fathers do this very differently and there's different that sometimes are exaggerated but are funny. I saw all sorts of, um, of, uh, of funny memes uh, about that. And of course, it depends on the context, the culture in which we're raised. There are different expectations of parents from one context to another. So, so there, there's a whole variety of ways to do this. Now, now, don't get me wrong. There is bad parenting. I'll get to that in a minute. I'm just talking about all the ways that good parents parent that are different than how other good parents parent. <laughs> if you haven't followed all of that, <laughs> and honoring those various ways that we do this. Now, I know this from uh, personal experience. My mother and father parented very differently from each other. Carol and I parent differently from each other. We parented together differently from the way that my two sisters and her two sisters did. And you know what happens. You probably experienced this. You may have done it. It happens when people do things differently. Well, we, we, we judge. Most people are pretty insecure, so we feel the need to defend ourselves or declare that we're doing it better and somebody else is doing it worse. And so that means even thinking or telling people that they're not doing it as well. And, and obviously, sometimes we change our opinion on that, as this uh, image suggests, um, as we grow up a little bit or have a different kind of experience. This gets trickiest when kids are growing up and begin, and the kids themselves begin to not like the way their parents parent. <laughs> we know this face. We've given this face. We've received this face, no matter if we're biological parents or not. But we did the same thing. We see their flaws of our parents. We see their mistakes. We see their inconsistencies. Every parent has them. And we decide that they're wrong or bad or screwed up. And perhaps we even rebel. A lot of us do at a certain age. Perhaps we determine that we will not be like them when we get to be parents. And maybe we're not. Or maybe we are. Some kids turn out to parent very differently than their own parents, for better or worse. Or sometimes they discover that they, our parents really knew what they were doing. Either way, we can honor them. We can recognize that each one was doing what they could, given who they were, given who we were given what was going on in the world and in our lives at the time, and we can just honor the intent and the effort. We can honor the sacrifice and the love, whether people got it right or not. Now, that's all good when we're talking about good parents, but what if, what if they didn't try hard? And what if they didn't sacrifice? And what if they didn't even love? Um, this is hard, and this is much harder. Some parents do abuse their children. Some of us have been on the receiving end of that. And maybe some of us have even been abusive and carry the weight of that. So what does it mean to honor parents? What does it mean to honor even ourselves who have dishonored that role? Now, I, I don't mean here the occasional act of bad parenting that we regret and learn from. We, we all have those. But I'm talking now about those who do or have done serious injury to their children and to themselves. 
and this answer is easier said than done, and I'm not going to minimize the pain or trauma of this. It deserves a much longer conversation. I just want to mention something in passing in the context of this conversation. The answer takes us back to the teaching that we did earlier this year, pre-COVID. We can honor the image of God in any person. And we can do that without having to pretend that their actions have been honorable or that their intentions have been honorable, without having to even to be in relationship with them, particularly if they continue to dishonor you or others. We can honor them, however, by seeing what God sees in them, just a little bit of God's self. No matter how tarnished, no matter how screwed up, and we can agree with God on that. It got me thinking about my own childhood a little bit. My father was um, not a uh, bad parent. Um, he tried hard. He didn't do bad things intentionally, but um, but he wasn't the best parent either. And um, I didn't know for a long time where he was coming from on this. And about 10 years ago or so, I went away on retreat for a few days to try to figure out what to do with him. And I was tempted to write him a letter saying, this is how I felt. But at that point, he was already deep into dementia and he, wouldn't, he never did recover from that. And he couldn't have understood. And even he probably wouldn't have even have understood if I had tried to communicate this prior to dementia. So, so what do I do with this? And instead, I, I think this was the Holy Spirit. I felt a prompting to write a letter to him, from him, excuse me, to me. It took me a long time, and in that process, I kind of got inside his mind and heart as best I could. We can never fully know someone else. But I discovered, as I tried to imagine what it was like to be him, I discovered that a little bit of some experiences I never had, um, what it was like to grow up as, as a tenth of 12 children of an alcoholic father, and what it was like to be a guy who could barely read and write, and and then be asked to raise a kid like me who thrived on academics, um, a man who had never been taught or shown how to process his own emotions. I, just, I got the picture of a father who was basically clueless about what it means to be a father and not his own fault on that. And when I was done, my anger kind of was replaced by compassion. I didn't excuse certain behaviors. But a couple of years later, when I spoke at his funeral, I was able to honor him in ways that I never would have been able to a few years before. So maybe you've had some similar experience, maybe something far worse, maybe something far better, I hope so. Let me ask you another reflection question. How is God inviting you to give honor to parental figure in your life? Maybe they're not even no longer with us. Or maybe they are, and there might be an opportunity to recognize the image of God in them. Or if they've done well and tried hard to be able to say that to them, um, particularly if you haven't or haven't done it as much, as you now sense that you would. Well, if we can honor all kinds of parenting, maybe we can honor all kinds of children as well. Just as parents need to express their parenting, their parenting love in different ways because of who they are, so children need to be honored for their own individuality so that each one can grow up to be who God created them to be. And this is, by the way, exactly how God parents us. God honors each of us as we are, treats us as individuals, each worthy of honor in our own unique path through life. Uh, this may be one of the reasons why Paul encouraged Ephesian parents to not exasperate your children. <laughs> well, there are many ways parents exasperate their children that I think some of them are well-deserved. <laughs> At least I hope so, because I did it to my own kids. But it was common, particularly in the ancient world, for fathers in particular, to use anger and authority is a primary means of raising their children and with predictable results. And we still struggle with that sometimes today, don't we? My dad did. And it was common then, as it sometimes is now, to make all the children in the family try to fit into the same mold. And it's a mold either determined by the parents or often established by the oldest child. <laughs> Now, I, I'm an older child. I'm the oldest child of my family, and I remember, my, particularly my youngest sister, complaining about how hard it was to follow in my footsteps. Cause she wasn't me. She didn't have on her, didn't want to have on her the same expectations that my parents had had for me. And that was fair. She was different. I was an overachiever at school and work. And I, you know, wanted affirmation for that, but I was very socially awkward. Still am sometimes. 
my sisters were much more comfortable with people not as worried about getting straight A's and winning approval all the time. And maybe they had a little more maturity as a result. So we could have learned so much from each other. And now in midlife, we do honor those different ways of doing life. But, and this but is important, in honoring each child's individuality, we must be careful to balance that with mutuality. To remind them, to show them in our own lives that we do live in relationship with each other and that we must live in relationship with each other. See, our culture here in the U.S., we, talk, we do much better of individualism than we do of mutuality. Much of what we talk about in public is my rights to do this or that, and we end up disagreeing, fighting with each other over who has the right to do what, but we don't talk as nearly as much about my responsibilities in relationship. Not just the joys of those relationships, sometimes not even as much in church as we could. So I love that God brings individualism and mutuality together in God as a trinity. There's the three, but the three are one. You see that? The individual and the mutuality. They're bound by a common love. They always work together, but they work differently. They honor each other. And it isn't just true about God, because as they are, so are we to be. This is how God intended us, made in God's own image, to live in our lives with each other. This is what we parents get to model to our kids, through our relationships with our own spouses, our own parents, our brothers and sisters in the church, with how we act toward people in public to bring together that individuality and honoring the person in front of us, but also to recognize that mutuality is what holds us together. So whoever you parent, however you parent, here's another reflection question for you. How is God inviting you to honor those that you parent in a way that honors their individuality, but also honors mutuality? How do you hold those in tension and be able to do both just like God does in the Trinity? Finally, one last kind of honoring. Let's honor God, our parent. And I've been alluding all along to the fact that God parents us. And there's something cool about that you, about that, that you probably already know, that God represents both the kind of behaviors traditionally associated with fathering and those that are traditionally associated with mothering. God is our example in both. No, I'm not, I'm not preaching heresy here. Let me explain. He is the merciful, nurturing, caring, and intimate father that Jesus talked about. Our father even used the word daddy to describe him there. And, but all those adjectives I just used, there are qualities that our culture has often associated with mothering. But we also know that God is also strong and protective and directing and providing, which are qualities that our culture is often associated with fathering. So let's just put it this way. For the purposes of understanding God fully, let's just appreciate that everything we associate with good parenting is something that God does. That's, that's my point in this. It's not just one side or the other. Everything we associate with good parenting, God does to us, for us, with us. And it's important that we do so lest anyone be afraid to approach God or think that somehow God is not enough because we mistakenly think that God acts completely out of one set of behaviors and doesn't recognize that God covers the whole gamut. So if you have trouble thinking of the fathering, what we would call the fathering pieces of God, you can lean into, into the qualities that, are, are, that our culture is called more mothering do so and vice versa, wherever you're at in your season of life. God is our model of parenting. Paul says it to the Ephesians, follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children. And as I said, we see this again in the Trinity and the various ways that the various members of the tr Trinity act as parents to us. And um, this is a little speculative, but it seems to fit the way that we understand in our own limited, uh, our limited experience, how the different members of the Trinity act. God, what we call God the Father, is the kind of parent who is able to step back and see the big picture. It doesn't freak out over the, the particular thing that's going on right now because they see the long-term trajectory. And uh, that's something we as parents need to do from time to time, right? And then God the Son is the kind of parent who steps in. You Remember, he was incarnate, came into our world, steps in and gets involved in the messiness of life with us. God the Son is the one who comes alongside of us and takes some of the heavy load, just like parents do for the kids. Hey, let me help you with that. And then, of course, God's son, son is the one who said, I go and prepare a place for you in the household of, of my father. And then there's God the Spirit, who is the kind of parent who steps ahead. You notice that? The father steps back, the son steps in, the spirit steps ahead, and shows us what direction to go. And then the goes there with us, guiding us, 
come on, let's walk this way. Let's go this way. God, the spirit is actually the love and the, the bond that holds our relationships together. And if you think about it in those ways, parenting requires all three at different points in time. And therefore, we need to trust God to show us in any moment how God is parenting us in whatever situation we're in. Or how we might follow God's example and how we're parenting those others in whatever situation they're in. To be able to move back and forth upon these different kinds of parenting and follow God's example. And so, one last reflection question here. It's actually two. In which way of parenting is God showing up for you now? Is God being more of the father and, and just saying, I, I see the long-term trajectory. Don't, don't be afraid. It'll be okay. Is God the son and showing up in your life and saying, let me carry some of that for you. It's gotten a little messy. It's God the spirit is coming along and saying, let me take your hand and guide you forward. And by the way, I want to I wanna bind you to me and to others with love. How are you invited to follow God's own example? Are there ways that you could be doing that to others right now? Well, I've given you a lot of reflection questions on the way, so I won't close with more of those. I want to close simply by honoring you. As parents of one sort or another, all of us, probably mostly all of us, have gotten to do that or do get to do that or invited to do that. As children of parents, because we all are, as children of God, children of a God who loves you and honors you too. The video we posted had its own prayer and uh, hopefully that's meaningful, but you might find the one I'm about to pray also helpful. And uh, I found it so helpful that I'm not only gonna pray it over you here now, but I've also posted it on the web page with this message. Uh, Amy did it up in a very nice uh, version that uh, maybe you'd like to download and hold on to, or maybe you'd like to download and pass it along to somebody else, email to somebody else, put it in mail to somebody, maybe to a parent who's, who's struggling a bit right now. Um, as a blessing of your own to encourage them and to honor them. This is a prayer of blessing. I'm calling it for all kinds of parents everywhere. It's like we honor everyone everywhere and it's adapted from a, um, from a longer version that I that I found online. Let me pray it for you. Dear God, bless every parent with the finest of your spiritual blessings today. Honor each one daily so they have no reason to doubt whether they are loved and valued and cherished in your own eyes. Create in them a deep sense of your protection and trust so the worry and fear will disappear as they place your loved ones, their loved ones into your care. Whisper deep within their spirit the words they long to hear from you, that nothing can ever separate them from your love. Remove any guilt, false or real, and replace it with your amazing grace. Calm every doubt and strengthen their confidence in the one who can bring good out of every situation. Teach them that they cannot meet every need of a child's life, but that you can. And help them to acknowledge their inadequacies yet recognize and accept your sense of pleasure in having them as your own beloved children. Where prayers may still seem unanswered and dreams are not yet realized, open their eyes to see beyond this world to a hope that never disappoints and to a God who will never leave or abandon them. Give them courage to persevere even in the most difficult moments of their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. And if you feel an amen coming on wherever you're at, um, shout one out. Because God does honor you. And God honors all parents on this in particular day. So may you have, indeed, whether you're a mother or not, have a happy Mother's Day. We too honor and love you. <laughs>